He happens to be a old batchmate of mine and a very close that's friend. So that's not the reason why he's here. That's the reason why I accepted the call. I will uh, read out the official introduction to Shoko Then I will tell you a couple of things about him, which is not there in the official introduction. He was born in December 1952, which makes him about a year younger than me. Uh, and he graduated with first class honors in B.Sc. Chemistry from Kolkata University in 1970. He was awarded a silver medal by his college for proficiency in his results. He passed out from IIM Calcutta in 1973. And he secured the second position in the order of merit and was placed in the institute's role of honor. In that, in our batch, there were three people in the role of honor. And uh, Shoposhaji was one of them. He was also awarded the Pfizer scholarship for his proficiencies. Immediately after finishing his studies at Ayam Calcutta, he joined Shipping Corporation of India in 1973, month of May. And he's been there ever since. So this is one thing I want to mention now, which is not part of his official CV. We have this myth that uh, in order to progress in your career, you need to change jobs. Mr. Hajra disproves that theory completely. He joined Shipping Corporation straight from IIM Calcutta, and he is still with Shipping Corporation, and is now the chairman and managing director of the company. So for career growth, it is not necessary to jump jobs. I think that's one bit I wanted to, you know, he explodes. The second thing is that he was promoted to the post of general manager in 1997, and was in charge of work carriers, chartering, special tankers, and LNG. He was chosen as project leader of the SCI team for Project Renaissance, which was a management consultancy project for corporate transformation. He was really elevated to the position of director, personnel and administration, and director Vivances in the year 2001, February 1. In September 1, 2005, he had assumed charge as chairman and managing director of Shipping Corporation of India, which explores the second we have the perception that uh, by the time you reach the top of an organization, you're kind of close to retirement, particularly if you're working in a PSU or a government organization. At the age of 53, he became the chairman and managing director of Shipping Corporation, which means he still has a long way to go before his tenure comes to an end because of retirement. So it's not that Tenure alone is good enough. Obviously, he would have done a few things right to be elevated to the position of a CMD at the age of 53, which would possibly make him, if not the youngest CMD of a PSU in our history, certainly one of the youngest CMD of any organization, private sector or public sector. Okay, so to keep that in mind as the second myth busted. He has delivered many speeches and made presentations on various national and international seminars and conferences on a vast range of management related issues. His many papers have been published in various shipping and non-shipping journals, as well as in dailies like the Hindu, Economic Times, etc. He has been a member of many Indian delegations at the International Maritime Organization, where he has represented not just the corporation, shipping corporation, but also the Indian National Ship Owners Association. He has represented the last organization, INSA, and the Indian Shipping Federations in organizations like conferences organized by the Indian International Labor Organization. Presently, he is the president of INSA, which is the Indian National Ship Owners Association, <laughs> as well as a trustee on the board of trustees of the Mumbai Port Trust. He has also been the vice president and director of the International Shipping Federation, which represents the international ship owners in all the important maritime fora like IMO, IRO, etc. He's also on the board of governors of the World Maritime University. Further, the Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers in the UK has elected him as an emeritus member. Sri Ajla has been associated with a host of management and internet industry associations. He is currently the chairman of the CII National Committee on Shipping and Maritime. He's also a member of the CII National <coughs> Council and the management committees of the ASOCHAM and the Bombay Chamber of Commerce and Industry. In the year 19, uh, 2007, Sri Ajay was conferred the Innovator of the Year Award at the India Shipping Summit. The Shipping and Maritime 2008, supported by Chemtech Foundation, 
has conferred the Business Leader of the Year Award for shipping on Mr. Hajj. That's the official introduction, and I've told you about him being a mythbuster. I have invited him here to burst out. I invited him here to help us a third minute. When you hear the word, or when we hear the word public sector organization, public sector banks, what comes to our mind is inefficiency, you know, slow, etc., etc. People at least of our generation who had a longer knowledge of history of our industry and uh, business in our country, we recognize that there is very critical importance that uh, public sector organizations have played in the growth of modern India, which is the subject we have invited Professor Mr. Hazar to come and address, and hopefully he burst that particular myth in your mind. So with those few words, I invite Mr. Hazar. Thank you very much, Jan. It's always embarrassing to listen to one's own CV being read out. But obviously, whenever routine goes, Anyone asks my CV, my office just forwards it. I always feel I wish I had a role in that, then I would have cut it into at least one third or four. First thing I want to tell all of you is that I don't want this session to be a monologue. You are absolutely free to stop me at any point of time, not only for questions, but also for comments, observations. If you feel that I am talking absolutely rubbish, please feel free to stop me and point out why I am, in your opinion, absolutely rubbish. Another thing I always say whenever I have not, not too many times I take this pleasure of concessions, <coughs> whenever I do take, I always mention that please do believe that no question can ever be foolish. Answer can be yes. Answer can be foolish, but not question. And if something is sort of creeping up in your mind, by raising that question, more often than not, you will help your fellow participants, because most likely the same question is also in their minds, but they are just feeling shy to raise it. So with this uh, very brief introduction and also saying that I was reading a speech given by our you know, modern day great scientist, Mashallah. I was just uh, going to, it was uh, put up on our IIMC Alumni Association website. And one uh, sentence which really I liked, he mentioned that whenever he is with the younger generation, the young folks, he feels extremely happy because that not only adds years to his life, but it also adds life to his years. So I found this statement to be very nice. So I thought I'll just take the opportunity of repeating it. Janto, why don't you sit down somewhere? I will. If you come closer, then you have a mic and then you can go first. Oh, I see. I, I hope, pardon, this is such a, such a small room. And uh, in addition to everything else, which Janto, of course, had no reason to mention, I'm also very fond of singing. <laughs> I can sing without the help of a you know, microphone, at least I mean, to a small audience. So I'm sure whatever I said already has been more than audible to you.
sort of PSU as a concept came up in India. PSU is today working in the PSU. And my corporate journey in the PSU, just a few words on that. During, you know, just after independence, India adopted a mixed economy where, of course, public sector and private sector both were given equal importance. But uh, actually, this concept of PSE came well before the independence. In 1938, a national planning committee was constituted by Indian National Congress. Basically, to deal with the subject of industrial development. That, you know, that planning document, as well as the subsequent document which was developed in 1944, which is known as Bombay Plan, by the so-called big force, that is the GRD Tata, GD Bidla, Sriram, and Mr. Vailalpai. This basically, you know, focused on the vital importance of central planning for a country like India, which did not have enough resources. So obviously planning becomes more important for a country which has lack of resources. And also the concept of the capital goods industry and the concept of public sector activities. So it's basically this 1938 document and 1944 document which laid foundation to the concept of ESUs after the independence. At the time of independence, India was more or less you know, an agrarian economy with a very weak industrial base, with a very weak infrastructure base, with uh, rather you know, low, low level of savings as well as investments. There were lots of socioeconomic problems like large scale discrepancies in income, regional imbalances. Uh, I, I see some, some of you of course, I used to have the same habit of jotting down something very meticulously I think uh, the, I mean, not only the PowerPoint presentation, but maybe just a sh short paper also has been sent to the institute, so you'll get it. So, so why India some of you can possibly concentrate better while jotting down, I don't mind, but try to concentrate uh, more on whatever I'm saying instead of just trying to jot it down, which was my habit and I may have lost something. Can see both. So as I was saying that uh, it was a situation where the private sector did not have adequate resources, managerial or scientific skills, and they did not have the will to at least invest into long gestation period infrastructure. And the country as a policy wanted to, which of course, I suppose is there even to be, alleviate property, you know, uh, uh, push up people from the below poverty level in the United States. Countries wanted to have equitable distribution of wealth and income. Countries wanted to have particularly, you know, the, uh, those regions which were backward to give a place to their development. And for all these, it was found absolutely essential for India to have state intervention in virtually all the important so-called poor sector of the industries. Subsequently, we had this industrial policy resolution of 1956, which has been, of course, amended you know, very many times thereafter with lots of you know, sort of new ideas being put into that, which again talked of the vital role of public sector in the industrial development of the country. To start with, it was considered essential 
for the public sector to be, you know, take care of four sectors like steel, power, coal, and heavy industries, fertilizers, oil, and if you see even today, you will find that the production of you know steel is something I don't remember the exact percentage, something like maybe 37 percent of what is in the public sector. Power, it is something like 78 percent. Coal, it is something like 87 percent. So even today, after you know, 60 years, we are in a situation when in this core infrastructure sector, public sector has a tremendously dominant role. But uh, to be very honest, when public sector first started, they were trying to just sort of implement the policies and plans laid out by the administrative ministries. But situation has changed dramatically. This was the situation in the 50s and 60s. But I would say, from the 70s onwards, many of the public sectors, they really became very efficient commercial organizations, drawing up their own plans for growth and development. And I think, if I am not mistaken, it was uh, first, of course, it was, that was even earlier, that was the concept of Nehru. And after all, you know, public sector was given a tremendous support by our first prime minister. We talked of public sectors as modern temples of India. And uh, I think it was Indira Gandhi who talked of the commanding heights, public sector reaching the commanding heights in India. So these, these things definitely happened because particularly in the poor infrastructure, it was entirely on the strength of these public sectors that our industrial development took place. But gradually, public sector started sort of you know, also emerging as important organizations in various other so-called non-core sectors. I just mentioned here, well, oh, that's much later, that with the policy of liberalization and globalization in the 90s, there was a feeling that many of the public sectors, particularly in the non-core areas, have served their usefulness and now they should be completely divested and made just like any other private sector organization. Now, of course, again, jumping few decades, if we look at today, then we are finding almost a reverse trend, not only here, not so much in India, but all over the globe. Just to give you an example, Indian shipping industry, including the Shipping Corporation of India, our main source of funding have always been the commercial overseas banks through the ECB group. Now in the recent past, after the so-called subprime development as well as the global meltdown of both economic and financial sectors, what has actually happened, many of these you know, commercial banks, they have been helped by their respective governments through bailout packages. And along with such bailout packages, the governments have put their nominees on board of such banks. And one of the most important function that these nominees perform is to ensure that primarily lending from such banks are only to their nationals and only for their national projects. So for a country like India, where unfortunately the financial institutes and banks have never had any appetite for shipping finance, we, the shipping organizations of the country today, find it a peculiar situation that you know these banks don't want to lend to shipping anymore, whereas our, in any case, our financial institutions are neither ready. So all that I was trying to say that you know the so-called concept of liberalization 
and if I may say so, pure capitalism and uh, you know and the private sector creation of wealth have taken a complete backseat. And if I may say so, the so-called concept of liberalization and globalization have been given almost a go by by many of the protagonists of you know globalization, even including USA and of course in any case Russia, China has always different. So basically even in India in in I would say early 2000 we had a concept that all the private public sectors, at least not if not all, many of them, those who are not in absolute core sectors, they will be divested, they will be privatized. But today of course that is taking a complete tax. Just to give you some idea about yes. how the yes sir, please. Uh, public sector uh, government building is in the range of somewhere fifty, sixty or seven years hundred percent. Somewhere there, there are now there are public sectors which even today are hundred percent government. Right. So there are public sectors which already the holding is uh, down to just fifty one percent. So why can't all the companies have fifty one percent? Because it's like uh, you have 75, you have a control rate. You have 15, still you have a control rate. Right? So that capital raise you can apply reducing fiscal rates. Why is it that you need to have 75? So as that we done the most, as long as government has 51%, that is a public sector. Yeah. The management structure, the governance structure, everything remains identical whether the government holding is 51% or the holding is 100%. Accepting, of course, if you are, you know, government holding is 51 percent, it means that it's a listed company. All the city guidelines and everything else applies. Stock exchange. Right. So I have absolutely no quarrel that uh, you know. But again, this is this is something which has to be done very gradually. Nothing to do with the public sector themselves, but because you know, okay, I mean that is there somewhere. I mean, uh, yeah, in this slide itself. Out of about 250 public sectors today that we have, 240 plus 7 which are in the insurance sector, they are not involved in that public sector. Only 41 are listed. And if you if you say that other public sectors should be listed, I, I completely agree with you. But uh, I mean, even the I mean, though you know our our uh, stock exchange stock exchanges and our I mean, investors have been doing reasonably well in service the entire world. But as far as public sector, uh, you know, divestment is concerned, if suddenly government tries to put, you know, a lot of stake into the capital market, obviously what will happen is that government will suffer very badly because it will not get, you know, the right price from the stock exchange. So it has to be done very gradually. Let's have it since uh, I'm talking of SCI. In SCI, there have been two tranches of disinvestment. Today, government holds 80.12% stake. And even, you know, the balance 19.88%, a large portion of that, again, is held by financial institutions like LIC, I mean, various, various other IDBI, etc. So please, and also foreign financial institutions. So the I mean, shares in the hand of general public is not even 5%. So we have all along felt that there is not enough liquidity in the market for our shares. So if another 5%, 10% stake is actually offloaded, we hope that it will actually do well for the strength. But anyway, that's a decision which less totally with the government. We have no role there. But uh, as I was uh, saying, just to continue, uh, when the first five-year plan started, there were only five PSUs in the country. The total investment into those PSUs was 29 crores. The contrast today, as on 31st March 2008, I couldn't immediately get to the 31st March 2009 figures. There are 242 central public sector undertakings, excluding the seven insurance companies. And the total investment is 
5,000 crore plus. So from 29 crores, it has come a long way. Now we are talking of you know, listing of public sectors. Today, there are only 41 listed public sectors. If you look at the first 10 companies in the country in terms of market cap, you will find three of them are public sector companies. And just these 41 listed companies, their market cap has gone up from something like 679,000 crores in 31st March 2007 to 1120,000 crores or 1120,000 crores on 31st March 2008, showing a 64.94% increase. I remember delivering a talk in IIM Calcutta. I think it was a function arranged by EIMA and IIM Calcutta put together their annual conversation. And I was asked to talk about working sector. That was maybe about three years back. I remember having said, that these 40 or 41 listed companies, they form about 16% of the total market cap consisting of, I think, 7,400 some companies which are listed. Now that figure, how it has changed today, today means 15th of September, I have got it, just because of today's lecture, I have got it calculated. The 41 listed companies, public sector, constituted 28% of the market cap. One year back it was 21%. So, I mean we can definitely say that definitely at least in terms of market cap, and of course I will give you some other figures also, the public sectors have done far better than the general market. You can, you, can, you know, out of 250 companies, 41 are listed, okay, even Acknowledging that many of these 41 companies are so called, you know, blue chip, top notch public sector. But still, just these 41 companies today constitute 28% of the entire you know, industrial sector in India in terms of market cap. So obviously, if all the public sectors would have been listed, then this percentage definitely would have been more than 50%. <laughs> <laughs> two, two index, one index especially for PACs. <laughs> the other thing I just wanted to bring to your attention that the number of profit making public sectors have been going up substantially and the figures that I got from the DP website that in 2004-05 it was 143, in 2007-08 it was 159 and of course Conversely, the number of loss-making PACs are going down. In 2004-05, it was 73, and 2007-08, it had already come down to 54. Another thing, which this figure doesn't immediately bring up, if you study, if you analyze these 73 or 54 loss-making public sectors, you will find that many of them, they were not started as public sectors. They were private se sector companies who were, you know, mismanaged and the company was about to get moved up. So just to ensure that all the employees do not immediately lose their job and go on the street, the government nationalized or government, you know, sort of took over such companies. So such sick companies then became public sector. And of course, some of them still continue to be making laws. So if you look at this, I am sure what my good friend Jayanthu started that some of you may still have the feeling that public sector always mismanaged, always inefficient. So I think definitely this goes to show that that's not the case. Rather, many mismanaged private sector companies after being converted into public sector, have come out of the red and have started making problems as well. Yeah, this is what I was just mentioning. 31st March 2007, the market cap of 
those 41 listed companies are 19.16 percent. That it was March 2008, it was 21.8 percent. And September 15, 2009, is 28.5 percent. This also establishes one more fact that during the meltdown, when the economy is in crisis, somehow the investors at large, the general public, they have more faith in the government and public sector rather than on the private sector. So because you can see that from March 31, 2008 to September 15, 2009, in just a few months, the percentage I mean, our representation of public sector in terms of market cap has moved up as much as 21.8% to 28.5%. Certain other important statistics relating to PSUs. The net profit of profit making CA, the PSUs, PSUs, the net profit, I mean, of course, it is PAT, but why I am also using the word net? Because it is netted after considering the loss made by the loss making public sector. So the net profit or profit making CFP CPS is stood at 91,062 crores in 2007 8. I'm quite sure, I don't know, in 2008 9, the figure would be even higher, possibly or closer to 100,000 crores from 89,578 crores in 2006 7. As a matter of fact, I had seen that this figure of net profit was growing at more than 10%, but it was only in this period, the 2006-07 to 2007-08, due to various reasons, including the world, you know, global climate, the global economic meltdown that the entities has not been matched. The average dividend payout of central public sector takings were 36.06% during 2007-08, which again compares very favorably if you take the, you know, the average dividend payment by the uh, private sector companies. The reserves and surplus of all CPACs went up from 416,000 crores in 2006 7 to 485,000 crores in 2007 uh, Just to mention, which is not uh, mentioned here, the contribution of public sector to the exchequer by way of dividends, by way of interest on loan, by way of duties and taxes have been increasing very substantially and if I am not mistaken the last figure that I recall it stood at about 170,000 crores and when you look at at least I am not talking of the total investment which is 455,000 crores but if you look at the equity investment of the government, in most of the companies, government has realized many, many folds of their equity contribution in the public sector. Just, for, just to give you an example again of SCI. SCI's paid up capital was 280.3 crores till the time last year we declared a boost to one bonus and obviously the paid up capital increased. But out of this 282.3 crores, 80% constitutes about 220 crores. That was the equity investment of the government, including some loans being converted into equity. And government, at least over the last five years, has been giving a rent of 200 crores. <laughs>
So I always say that if we depend quite a lot on technology, what it is, I mean, without technology we can't even think of leaving today. But sometimes it lets you down very badly. <laughs> Once I remember, I had gone to meet you know, very senior executives of Petronas. At that point of time, there was a possibility of Petronas exporting liquefied natural gas to India. And I had gone to meet Petronas as well as their subsidiary, which at that point of time was not a fully owned subsidiary, which today is the Malaysian International Shipping Company, MIC. So I had gone to meet them. I'm just to present SCI and trying for a tie-up so that we also can get involved in the transportation of liquefied natural gas from Malaysia to India. And I found, to my horror, that the plug doesn't fit in in Malaysia, and they could not come up with any adapter which could immediately help me in making the presentation. Very fortunately. I was just uh, a little later talking a little bit about wisdom, which is not only knowledge but which also and, uh, you know, encompasses the experience. Very fortunately, I had the wisdom of carrying hard copies of the presentation in quite a few numbers. So I could at least distribute it to them and then continue the discussion. So sometimes really technology can really let it come. So anyway, some important statistics. You know, disinvestment has always been a big word in, in the context of public sector. SCI at one point of time was, uh, you know, decided to be privatized. Not only, I mean, not only this divestment, but we were thinking of going through a strategic partner where the management control will rest with the support strategic partner. And government at that point of time had decided to retain less than 49% of it. CI of never went to But as I am saying that the uh, government has raised 53,423 crores by disinvesting stake of public sector undertaking. The public sector today employ a little over 1.5 million personnel. The net profit to capital employed stands at 10.45%. Net profit to network stands at 15.38%, dividend payout, I already mentioned, 36.06%, tax provision to profit before tax is 34.8%. I am not in a position to exactly give you corresponding figure for the entire, you know, I mean, all the companies covered under at least under Sensex, etc. But I am sure, I am very confident that these figures will compare pretty favorable. Today, of course, it's very much there in any organization, be it public or private. Today, one of the things which everyone does is to try to benchmark itself. So every annual accounts, even quarterly accounts that we keep the I mean, we list to our board, we present to our board, we bring out the comparison of our performance Services not only Indian private sector shipping companies, but also, I mean, you know, overseas, the absolute the top of the line, it's USK line, which is the world's largest shipping company today in terms of tonnage. Just to give you again, sorry, I'm digressing, but uh, just to give you the perspective, Mitsui USK line owns a fleet of about 55 million BW in Canada. The Indian network tonnage today is just over 15. SCI's network tonnage is little over 5. We, we are roughly about 25% of the national tonnage. Our fleet is about 25% of the national tonnage. But uh, all that I was trying to say, this US Kilai's tonnage is close to four times, just below four times that of India's national tonnage. So again, when we present our accounts, we always try to give, you know, we try to benchmark ourselves and give the performance of the Swimiski line, NYK line, AP Motor Bus, all these companies, MISC, MISC only because in terms of headway, in terms of diversification, 
that is one company which comes very close to this line in terms of their peak composition rate of energy. ESUs, as I already mentioned, ESUs contribution to Central Exchequer on investment dividend and interest 2005-06, 15,000 crores is a drawn up to 20,000 crores in 2007 Tax and duties that works out again from 110,000 crores is a drawn up to 145,000 crores. So total contribution to the Central Exchequer has been, as I said, I had a figure of 170,000 crores in the year, it's about 166,000 crores. As far as uh, ESU's contribution to the economy, these, you know, these financial contribution which can be immediately numbered is, is there for everybody to see. The Department of Public Enterprise, which is the normal agency for central public sector undertakings. Now another thing, I think I, in all fairness I should mention here, that whatever figures have been presently, they only represent these are about 250 central public sector undertakings. But there are, I mean, equal number, if not more, number of state public sector undertakings. Unfortunately, you know, the figures of state public sector undertakings will not be readily as so readily available. But this uh, DP, Department of Public Enterprise, which is the local agency in the central government, union government, for the central public sector undertakings. They print out the figures, you know, highlighting the performance of public sectors every year, and that is available in their website. But this is only, as I said, only the financial performance, just in terms of numbers. But PSUs actually serve a far more important role in the national economy. First and foremost, you will never find private sector to be interested to be invest into the so-called backward regions. It is always that, even for that matter, I mean, today of course through governmental policies they are being compared, but you will find that at least in the beginning, all the so-called, you know, non-core sectors of aviation they were only covered by Indian airlines. Jet, English Air, they had no interest in them. Of course, subsequently, the Director General of Civil Aviation, they have formed a policy that if you want to apply in a core sector, in two of them or something like that, I don't know the formula exactly, you have to have at least accept one or more sector, things like that. But it is the public sector which has always been tasked to sort of bring up the regional balance and to encourage the development of the backward regions. Another extremely vital role that public sector has performed over the decades since independence at least is that of human resource development. Development of skills and you know basically I mean if you look at the think of shipping first if you look at Great Eastern, which is the second largest on the next SCI, second largest shipping company in the country, marketer, third largest, Varun, SR, Tulani, any one of them, if you look at their organization, you will find, other than the promoters, promoters of course, these are all family driven companies, but other than the promoters, <coughs> almost, I would say maybe 80% or more of top professionals, they all have worked in SCI at one time or the other. And this is, I am taking a lot of pride in SCI, but this is nothing unique for SCI. If you look at Reliance, you will find most of their professionals have come from IOC. If you look at any private sector banks, you will find they have come from SBI or other public sector banks. If you look at power sector, you will find it is NTPC which has been the breeding ground for professionalism and professionals in the power sector. If you look at heavy industry equipment, it is the BHL. So this is the pattern 
which is there in virtually all core sectors, steel. Now again, let me report none other than one of the big fours, JRD Tata. JRD Tata had said that man for man, Hindustan Steel, which is the previous name of today's C, Steel Authority of India Limited. Man for man, Hindustan Steel is far ahead of his core. Tata and Steel. Of course, he did mention that there is something slightly wrong in the system of public sector which many a times do not allow the you know more competent professionals to possibly contribute as much, which is a fact that I think that that's what he had mentioned. But otherwise he did acknowledge that in terms of professionalism, in terms of competence, you know, Hindustan Steel was ahead of this school. And this has been the case in virtually all the sectors. It is the public sector which have been the breeding ground, they have bring professionalism in the industrial development of India and the private sector thereafter have gained because of their training. Even today, if you look at any industry, you will find the kind of training which is continuing to be imparted by the public sector is absolutely unparalleled. Somehow private sector have never really invested the same kind of money, energy into training and human resource development that has been but uh, since we are talking of uh, human resources, a lot of the current uh, generation they are not very keen on working with uh, PSUs. Like the reasons they give is you know, something like uh, you have a designation bias or their opinions don't come. So, sir, is it uh, true or is uh, just a myth? No, no, it is anything. <laughs> of course, I have to go into a little bit, you know, personal matters here. We had a professor. Fantastic professor Nitish Devi in Asia, and uh, he somehow told us, us means my guys that I am talking about, that in India the higher education is highly subsidized. So it is not only your parents who are contributing to your education and upbringing, but it is also the society at large and the country which is contributing to your, to your upbringing and education. And the best way to give back to the society, as he mentioned, was to work for government or public sector. Where you are, I mean, of course, I will never say that by working for private sector, you are not creating wealth for the nation. Of course you are. But still, you are largely working for a handful of promoters. Of course, again, you can say that's a myth because to look at from private sector, particularly not today, but a couple of decades back, when the hostile takeover was not so much in fashion. In those days, some of the private sectors used to be run by promoters with 7%, 5% equity stake. So the general stake again belonged to the society at large, to the financial institutions, to the general public. So again, that is there. But Anyway, what he mentioned at that point of time, of course, we didn't question, but uh, what he mentioned was that the best way to give back to the society is to work for private sector, uh, sorry, public sector and government. But I must also honestly admit, yes, I did decide to work for public sector. I joined as CI. But in those days, in 73, I did not have to make so much of sacrifice because my gross salary in 73 was 1,400 rupees per pound. In 73, Hindustan Lever took management trainings for which the stipend was 800 rupees per pound. If I recall correctly, there was only one company which paid substantially more than SCI and that was, again the name today is non-existent, FNCB. Because in those days, Citibank used to be known as First National Citibank, which paid 1900 rupees. So I have no hesitation to, you know, I mean, admit clearly that while I did decide to join public sector, but I did not have to make that kind of sacrifice. Today, after 91 liberalization, what actually happened is that the private sector salaries exploded, whereas public sector salaries did walk but definitely nowhere in the same proportion. 
you know, uh, let me talk of again my illustrious batchmates, Sanjeev Aga, who heads uh, IDS and, uh, and uh, you know, Ram Raj, who used to head SIFI at one time. He has left and he's with DC and other things today. Now they must have been giving in terms of crores of rupees, whereas even after the increase and all that, the public sector gross salary for a CEO today will be somewhere maybe in the region of 20, 24, 30 lakhs in that region. So the difference is enormous. So today, if the boys and girls are not getting attracted, they have different reasons. But last year I started 